Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Data Driven Podcast. I'm Dave Mariani. I'm the CTO and co founder of AtScale. And today's guest is David Jayatilaka. And, Jay- and David is the co founder and CEO of Delphi Labs. So, David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Great. It was great to have you because, uh, as we sort of mentioned, uh, you know, we're, we got to know each other uh, from LinkedIn um, because we, we're, we're fans of the semantic layer. So we're going to be talking a lot about the semantic layer and our different angles towards, uh, uh, towards you know, d- delivering on that, uh, on the, the value of the semantic layer. So we're taking two different sort of paths um, that are pretty interesting. So, 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 David, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit uh about uh yourself and then your path into co-founding and starting delphi labs yeah um sure so i've been in data for about 12 or 13 years now i started out as a, an analyst and but in that time i did many different you know roles and activities which you'd now call analytics engineering data engineering a little bit of data science and in the back end of that time i led data teams at at different organizations in different industries. So, you know, e-commerce, grocery, fintech, um, teams from two, uh, where I was quite a heavy IC, and then up to like a 25 person data org where I was quite hands off and it was managing teams of teams. Um, So that's kind of like how I, you know, that's been my journey in data. And then after that time, I entered startup land and worked at a couple of startups like um, Metaplane and Avora before moving on to found Delphi, which is what I'm doing today. So uh, so how, how did you actually get started in data? What, what, can you tell, tell me a little bit about your background in terms of education and the like? And so, and was that something you always wanted to do or is it something that just uh, you, you, you end up falling into from another route? So it's definitely not, you know, it's very hard to be at school thinking I'm going to be like a data engineer. That's not, that's right. I don't, think, I don't think school children think that way even today. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, but I was always that child. So if you ask my mom, she'll say, I was always asking why or how much. And I was always quantitatively minded. So mm-hmm. when I was at school, I, I studied uh, science and maths and computer science predominantly. And then when I went to university, I studied uh maths with like a mixture of economics and finance and management so i think it what i study was is actually quite well geared towards working in data and uh then when i left university i ended up in like big four accounting at emy and i i realized that there that i really enjoyed the analytical side of the work which is it was it was the advisory side rather than the audit side of the business so I did a lot of um, I I did some modeling in that time Uh, and I really enjoyed that and I I realized I wanted to do that full time so I looked for analyst jobs this and this is little did I know that this involved me you know learning databases and SQL I didn't I had no idea I just knew I liked analysis so that's how I ended up looking for my first role as an analyst yeah, I really, I really, I really like that. You know, I always ask people how they got into it, and there's never obviously a direct path into analytics. It's always sort of from another angle. But I like what you said about you were as a kid. You asked a lot of questions. You asked a lot of questions about why and how. I feel like the same way. For my path, it was economics. So uh, you know, <laughs> so nothing, nothing really to do with data or databases at all, or even engineering for that for that matter. Um, but yeah, here we are, uh, co-founders of our, of our respective companies centered in databases and analytics. Yeah. So, uh, so, so with that, uh, tell me a little bit about Delphi Labs and, and the kind of kinds of problems that you guys are attacking for customers. Sure. So at, at Delphi, like, what we're trying to solve is the overall workflow of how um, someone who is probably a non-technical uh user at an organization um, wants to ask a question that should be answered with data and then how do they get to that answer? So the whole workflow is, is really what we want to solve. Um, so if you think about how they might ask a question, you name, they might ask a question like, oh, can you tell me what our revenue was by marketing channel last week? Mm-hmm. And what we do is we use the large language models, which are, you know, taking over the world today 
to uh, interpret that question into a, a semantic layer API request. And when we do that, we can find out, well, what objects in the semantic layer are related to that question? And therefore, do we have existing work, existing questions that are similar to the question that could be offered as a good solution to the question? And then mm -hmm. finally, if that's not possible, we will generate a new semantic layer request to generate to pull data to answer the question as well. Yeah. So it, it's um, uh, so, you know so there sort of there are sort of you know there uh, BI platforms out there that sort of use natural language query. So is it is it um, you know and I always looked at those and thought how do they do that without a semantic layer behind it because how can you actually map. Uh, you, you, know, you map the language to actual entities and objects to be able to ask the right question. So, uh, so talk to, talk to me a little bit about that. So, the approach of sort of natural language query sort of tools versus um, versus your approach, which really leverages a semantic layer. Um, what, what's the what's the difference? If is it about fidelity or is there more than that? So, I think the the I think if you think about the tools that existed before large language models became uh, front and center. I, and I, mm -hmm. I would say they're probably things like Metabase and ThoughtSpot are the ones that most people think of. Um, mm -hmm. they, they require users to know how to speak to uh, speak in the right syntax and then and have the mm -hmm. right sentence structure. So they're expecting a certain sentence with certain verbs and then uh, you to input uh, exact metrics and dimensions that exist in the semantic layers um, in order for it to work. And otherwise, it, it, it won't even allow for uh, you to put in a noun which isn't a metric or dimension in that semantic layer. And so, in some ways, they're not as intuitive as you you might you, as you might hope. But with Delphi. Someone can just ask a question and there's no restriction on how they can write their question. It's just like talking to a person and then using the large language models to, to do things like vector similarity and um, generating a prompt using them as well. We will then find the appropriate metrics and dimensions in the semantic layer as much as we can. Obviously, there's a probabilistic uh, element to it as well, uh, but that's mm -hmm. how we work. We don't ask people to write in a rigid way or necessarily even know the names of the metrics exactly. So for example, things like um, gross merchandise value and revenue are kind of synonymous at times. Delphi, you know, can handle that kind of uh, similar uh, names uh, inside, a, inside an organization for the same thing. Yeah, that's so. So, what I expected, or what I suspected, I guess I, cause I should say, is sounds like it's so you really have tackled the problem by uh, by leveraging that leveraging that semantic layer and a large language model, putting those together to make it so that you can uh, so that people can ask questions naturally versus having to actually understand what those entities are and getting it exactly right. So that's yeah. that's that's really fascinating. So, um, so you know, so David, like you know. Um, you know, I always like to. You're a, you're a fellow entrepreneur and a co-founder. Um, you know, what sort of drove you to 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 take that leap? Um, have you been a co-founder before? Or uh, so you know, what was your what was actually your path to becoming a co-founder and starting a company to solve this problem? Yeah, so I have been a co-founder before. So uh, my first role, kind of like outside of being a data team lead, was as chief product and strategy officer at a company called Avora. Yeah, it was actually a company that was being run by someone I knew and I'd known for a long time. And he he was looking after like a couple of uh, startups at the same time and was struggling a bit. And I, I thought, you know, I can not only can I help you by take trying to take spin this new business out of the existing one, but I also have ideas of what I'd want to do with that business. Incidentally, it's it's in a not too dissimilar space, which is metrics observability. Uh, on, mm -hmm. on, on top of the semantics layer. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like my first experience of co founding. And the great thing at the time was that I had someone who was an experienced co founder next to me, kind of showing me the ropes, which I, I think without that, I would have probably not had the confidence or the understanding to, to become one. And whereas this time around, I, I feel like I've gained a lot and, and the kind of have a good idea of how it works. 
Well, it definitely takes it definitely takes a lot of courage to take the leap. So I'm glad you I'm glad you have. Um, <laughs> so so let's let's turn our attention to semantic layers. Um, you know, in, in your mind, you know, what's a semantic layer, and and why is a semantic layer important in our in our the data and analytics ecosystem? So for me, a semantic layer is a map between objects in the real world. So they could be customers, users, revenue, uh, orders, and data, like data structures. And so if you think about how, you know, a table with a column is a data structure and the column could be, you know, sales amount, but summing that column from that data structure gives you revenue, which is a known entity. Right? That kind mm -hmm. of mapping is what I think of as what a semantic layer holds except a semantic layer, in addition to having things like metric definitions, uh, which the metrics layer would have, also has the under, has the mapping of what an entity is to a data structure as well. Like this ID is a customer ID and that's related to a customer and that's how you uniquely measure customers. So, you know, there's, there's um, the semantic layer and metric stores sort of get used interchangeably as terms, uh, David. So what's your, what's your opinion on that? Same or different? If they're different, how are they different? So I think metrics layers are a subset of semantics layers. And I feel like the main thing that people understand as additional in a semantics layer is a metrics layer can have many metrics or measures and dimensions mm -hmm. about entities, but they don't actually have to define what the entity is mm -hmm. because you don't need to in order to use the data. Whereas a uh, semantic layer will uh, define the entity as well. And, and that allows for some additional ergonomics in how you can develop with it because you, you can start doing things like inheritance of entities, you know, so, you know, customers are, uh, you know, an inherited class from user and things like that, which aren't aren't as easy to do if you don't have entities defined. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great. So, uh, you know, semantic layers have been around probably since um, I don't know uh, business objects. At least ninety two <laughs> universe. Yeah. So, so why are we talking about them so much now? Do you think, David? Like, why is why is it a popular theme and people talking about semantic layers? I know I'm talking a lot about it, but mm -hmm. wanted to get your opinion on that. I think it's because, um, as, as much as I don't like the sort of term, of like data is the new oil. I think like that era of, from the big data era onwards, um, mm -hmm. where we've had disruption in the data stacks and we've had increased interest and then with the increased interest we've had all this hype around data but then it's been very very difficult to actually deliver on any of it because we've lacked fundamental like uh, skills and tools and data engineering which have become better but we still lack some of the things like uh what the, some of the things that semantic layers offer and also on the ML side, like feature stores offer. You know, and I feel like the two mm -hmm. are somewhat aligned as well. So I think it's it's the the demand has 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 led to semantic layers coming about. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, and we sort of lived through the sort of the self-service revolution, didn't we, where yeah. um, it was sort of like, it became sort of anything goes. Uh, it's like, it seems like the pendulum is swinging a little bit back towards the middle, hopefully, uh, before we had IT delivering and doling out all the analytics to the business, then we had the business doing it themselves, and neither of those approaches really work very well, do yeah. they? Um uh, so it seems like we're sort of swinging a little bit back into the middle where we have some governance over those, of, over, you know, metrics and dimensions and, and the semantics of the business to allow for self-service, but not in anything goes kind of a, of a realm. Yeah. Um, so, so business intelligence and business intelligence tooling has changed a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, so from your perspective, it's like, um, how do independent semantic layers and, and BI tools, how, how do they play together or how should they play together in your mind? Um, so I think obviously we're talking about some kind of integration. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel like the integration should happen 
I, I've seen I've seen a few different ways, and I, sometimes it's it's like I feel like the semantic layer pretends to be a, a database in the BI tool's eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 the database can speak Postgres SQL to the semantic layer, but the semantic layer is hiding the fact that the entities it's sharing as tables to the BI tool are actually um, mm -hmm. abstractions on top of a real database that it's hiding. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like I understand the reasoning behind doing that, but I also feel like it's a it's not as good as a true integration between the BI tool and the semantic layer, which is maybe over a, over a better API protocol like REST or GraphQL or something like that, where that the BI tool is you know using the full features of the semantic layer, being able to just ask for the catalog of metrics and dimensions and then request data using using those terms as well. I think that's a much better way for them to play together. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, you know that we're still dealing with like sort of like that that generation of sort of visualization tools, and they are all sort of are, are at fault really here, where they're really sort of wired for talking to a database. Yeah. And so um, as a, as a semantic layer, the only sort of way you can share the semantics of that data model is through a database, which means you got to turn everything into database tables and columns, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and they're you know so we've been pushing our our visualization tool partners to give us provide us you know a way to deliver those semantics you know and and, and yeah you could still generate queries that look like SQL um, but we need to be able to deliver the hierarchies and the the metrics definitions and the dimensions and their descriptions and all the the goodness that comes with a fully baked out uh, semantic layer. Yeah, and I, I and I fully understand why that kind of duck talk SQL needs to happen because of because of they they're not willing to give you a different interface, and so therefore you've worked yeah. you've worked with them as 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 you can. So I get it. I just think it would be ideal <laughs> in an idealistic way. It'd be better to do it, you know, using a true API. You know, David. So that's that's how we, you know, like for uh, that's why we implemented <clears throat> MDX as an interface as well as DAX um, because at least in, in those interfaces <clears throat> you're dealing with metadata and and obviously the ability to generate queries. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like an ideal interface for for Tableau, which wants to speak SQL. You know, we use the TDS as a way of transferring our information uh, so that you know so that it does look like. Um, a fully looks it looks like the semantic layer that the modeler and the, the and the and the semantic modeler designed. Uh, so there's there's different tricks of doing it, but it certainly isn't uh, isn't uh, as as ideal as we'd like. Yeah. So you know, so given you know, given sort of the the state of the the, the BI market, like what what do you what's your view of 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 where things you think are going to go from here? Because we're still like dealing, I think, with that that generation, that self-service first generation of BI tools, do you think that we're going to see them um, move in a different direction or where do you think it's, we, we go from here when it comes to consumption and BI tools and the, the analytics consumer? Yeah, I, I, I do think um, we will see the semantic layer kind of split out from the BI tool, but then be designed to be used with the BI tool. So if you, as you saw recently, GCP uh, pulled out Looker's LookerML from Looker by offering Looker Modeler as a standalone semantic layer, and I think you know that's probably going to be the first move of the hyperscalers to do such a thing. Um, I I imagine that this will happen more, and you know, they like even the likes of Tableau. I know organizationally they there are some challenges at the moment, but. Um, they have acquired semantic layers in the past, you know, um, yeah. but they haven't deployed them fully. So I can imagine, you know, with Looker's with Looker and GCP's move, that some of the other players will also consider doing something similar in the near future, um, because I feel like the, the the organizations owning those tools, like if you think Microsoft and Google owning Looker and Power BI, what they really want is people to increase their cloud spend and their mm -hmm. overall spend with, with Microsoft or Google as an organization. Actually, what consumes 
the semantic layer isn't so important. It's actually more that the upstream resources from the semantic layer of the data warehouse or the cloud compute of some kind is, is theirs. And so I think it, it does logically fit that they just want to allow people to consume it more readily through many different mediums. Yeah, you know, like one one of the goals for starting at scale for me was that um, you know it's it really seemed like as we moved away from the the, the all in one BI platforms um, and we got more towards the visualization tools. The visualization tools sort of like forced users to understand the data the data platforms. They, they forced them to understand how to write SQL um, and how to join tables and how to create relationships and. To me, that was really a step back because it, you know, there's not everybody who could write SQL, right? Most people are 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 working within Excel or something, a tool like that. Yeah. And so, uh, and so, for me, a semantic layer, and I and I love what you're doing because you added, you know, the natural language query part to it, which even makes it more ubiquitous and easier to use for everyone. Because really, everyone in the organization should be an analyst. There shouldn't even be a role called analyst, everybody should be an analyst and asking questions of the data. But we've made it so hard with the current tools, haven't we, to, to really be able to allow everybody truly democratize access to data. It's just right now, it's just if you know how to write SQL, which seems like a, seems like a, a bad idea. And even, even the self-serve, the so-called self-serve tools, um, they, while they don't require someone to be able to write SQL, they do require like a level of knowledge similar to being able to use a pivot table in Excel. Mm -hmm. And, I, and mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes the tech industry forgets that that's actually quite a high level of assumed skill. Actually, if you think about a large organization, a huge percentage of that organization isn't at that level of skill. And yeah. so that's one of the great things about Delphi is that they don't have to have, have that skill. They just need to ask things in a natural, logical way and they can get an answer. Yeah, you think about it, right? It's like every, everybody can Google something, um, and uh, can anybody create a, a pivot table or or figure out how to connect to a database? I think there's a big gap there between those yeah. two things. So, so I, I do love what you're doing with Delphi because um, you're really making it Google-like, right? Google search-like, um, except it's all connected to data and powered by a semantic layer. So I love it. Um, all right, so let, let's let's let's. It's actually kind of a, a a related topic is you know large language models you said it um generative ai um people uh know it as gbt and chat gbt being sort of like the first killer application that's really sort of rocked everybody's world um so what do you think about uh what do you think about that is it hype or is it something is it something real and and, and a sea change what's your what's your opinion on that david I think it's real, and you see people like Bill Gates say this is like the most important thing since the graphical user interface. And, you know, I don't think someone like him would say that like lightly. You know, that's his. That was the thing that made him and Mike and his company. Um, and I agree with that. I think, but I I also think it's it's this technological step change, much like you know. If you go through human history, you've got like the wheel, the loom, the printing press, then you've got the computer, mm -hmm. the database, cloud. This is then the next one of those things. And it will drive a step change, just like the previous technological ones have done. And but I don't see it as being as scary as some people or put it or as or as truly amazing. You know, I don't think they're actually like a real mind, you know, that, that's not the way I see them. Yeah, there is a lot of a lot of fear out there about people losing their jobs or, or um, you know, getting to the point where Skynet is you know, <laughs> self aware. Yeah, I think the the, for, the former concern is probably more real, you know, because yeah. fundamentally a lot a lot of uh, white collar jobs in in the Western world fundamentally generate content of some kind, whether that's emails or or actual like articles or blog posts or whatever a lot of a lot of jobs generate content but even spreadsheets are kind of content um so if those things can be automated there is a risk of losing jobs but i think what we've seen in the past is whenever like humanity has had this increased ability to do work they just do more work they don't do the same work with fewer people they just do more work 
Yeah, that, that's I'm I'm on the same being so being an e e economist and for in training, so uh, you definitely see that that uh, that it makes people more productive. Just I got just last week, uh, a, 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 there was a, a a prospect or sales said, "Hey, we got this RFP, and there's here's the questions." And I just thought, you know what? It's like this already exists. I've already written this a hundred times, seriously. But now I got to come up with another version of it. And so I just went and used chat GBT and it came up with a great, I just literally just changed two, one or two words and was there and then freed up a, a bunch of time. It would have taken me half an hour to do what I was able to do in about two minutes. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Anything repetitive like that, I can just see it being, being automated. Which is so, a good thing, uh, so I think. <laughs> I think it is too. So, so how how do you think that how, how do you think that affects the job of of the or sort of the the, the data scientists and 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 machine learning and and that that whole sort of ecosystem that has been so top of mind, you know, in the past few years. So, if you think of the ML world, I'm not sure. Like, I I think what will happen is rather than them spending ages writing a lot of boilerplate code to access data or manage data, and I think that that part where they'll be able to just ask some chat GPT type or copilot type interface and it will just generate those functions and script for them and they'll just read it knowing having a good understanding of the language and understanding what it's doing and because it runs but they understand it great so that will just save them days of time and then when it gets to some of the more intricate um, things which there isn't so much pre-trained data on then that's when they'll actually put their hands to work but that's good because that's you know where they're adding the most value they're not spending their time doing all of the boilerplate work so i think it's i think it will be like a it will just increase productivity so david like um sticking with the data scientist theme here do you do you think that uh, a data scientist can take advantage of a semantic layer going tying those two together is that uh, is that some and have you have you seen examples of that in your, in your work? Yes, um, I have. So what, one of the first like semantic layers I played around very heavily with uh, was uh, LookML. So the organization where we had Looker and LookML, we had a data scientist around the business who did use Looker quite, quite a lot. And so whether they'd used it for just monitoring their models or, or even possibly generating inputs to their models, they were doing that. So, and it, and it made it more, um, you know, they, it made their code drier because they could just use something and then reuse it in another model. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are benefits. And I, I see, and if you think about on the input side, I think feature stores and semantic layers have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the monitoring side, they're almost, you know, if you think about uh, ML, uh, metrics monitoring uh, and then normal BI there's very little technically different to them at all uh, totally totally agree yeah we see the same thing it's just that you know the semantic layers it, it's the focus has always been on that sort of business analyst persona but we see a whole lot of value coming out of, of data science just to, for the same reason um, you know being able to get access to verified consistent metrics without having to engineer those yourself yeah. is a big time saver and drives consistency. So I think it, it makes sense. I think one of the main changes is probably that semantic layers are sometimes not as concerned, especially in the way they're set up, sometimes are not as concerned with the state of things at a given time. And feature mm -hmm. stores are very, very concerned with that because they always want to make sure that the event horizon that they're predicting, you know, they have data at that state. And I think mm -hmm. as semantic layers provide, you know, better support for things like SEDs, like SED type twos, like then mm -hmm. they'll become more powerful as feature stores as well. Love it. Love it. That's a great, that, that's a great call out. So, uh, so we're just about up on time, David, is there, Anything like you want to, you know, pr predict in the next five years, or think that things that 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 listeners should be aware of in this uh, in this brave new world uh, that we're facing in data and analytics. I, I mean, this is something that I 
you know, as someone who, who used Looker and had to deal with a semantic layer baked into the BI tool, I think data leads will be less tolerant of that, especially now that you've got the likes of at scale, cube and DBT having standalone semantic layers that they can use and that they can then move around to different BI tools as, as they should say, please. And it de-risks their situation as well. So I think we will see a move towards them um, because you know nobody wants to be locked in and at, at the behest of of a of, of one vendor, and so I think I think we will see that move, and I and I definitely hope that we will. Well, we obviously agree. We, we agree to, on that point. So uh, uh, this has been great, David. I'll, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, um, you're you're doing some amazing things, uh, and uh, you know, hope to hope to be able to combine the two technologies to, you know, get more people making data driven decisions. So with that, David, thank you so much for joining uh, me today in our conversation, and thanks for to everyone out there who's listening and uh, for another data-driven podcast. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Great to speak.